Hey, my name is Dr. Brendan McCarthy. Welcome to my podcast. I am the Chief Medical Officer at Protea Medical Center in Chandler, Arizona. I always start my podcasts with the same thing. I want you to please know that I have in the details section or the description section of this video has a complete list of works cited, things that I've researched getting ready for today's podcast. Especially today's podcast has a lot and it's important that you know it's there because the stuff I'm going to talk about, a little controversial, but it is really important that you understand it and know about it. So I teased this at the last episode about how you could detoxify from aging. That's crazy talk. Can I slow down the aging process by detoxification? Actually, yeah, you can. And it's scientific and it's real. What on earth am I talking about? I'm talking about something called advanced glycation end products. And the abbreviation for it is A-G-E, or it just spells age, it's kind of funny. But, um, you know, I was speaking to Justin, my, my producer, and uh, I, we had feedback that sometimes I use a lot of technical terms, and I do, and I don't want to. And I want to get better than that because I know that that's my language I use every day in my head, and that's what I read, and that's my brain is working that way. But every day I talk to patients and real people in a room with me, and sometimes I still catch myself when I get caught, or I get caught, in this case, get caught, using overly technical terms. So I'm going to do my best to be clear. It's not because you can't understand that term. It's because you haven't heard it. I use this analogy with my patients all the time. This is an important one. Is that if I went to your place of work and tried doing your job, I probably wouldn't be able to do it. Most likely, I really would not be able to do it. But if I spent time and you trained me and I learned, I could probably do it over time. It's the same thing as medicine. If you spent enough time studying, reading, getting involved in it, and you loved it, you this would come to you. It'd be like second nature. It's like that. So just when I use these complex terms, please know, they just sound complex because you haven't really heard them very much. And so it's not me trying to be fancy and sound fancy because I know sometimes doctors do that. It's just, this is just a language I get. So I will be more conscious moving forward to be better with those terms that I use. And then when I use them because I need to use them, I'll make sure they make sense. Okay. So advanced glycation end products, which is just one of those terms. What the heck is that? What is that? Advanced glycation end products are when sugars attach to proteins or lipids, in this case fats, um, in our bodies. And, and when this sugar attaches to it, basically making, making it candy coated, that creates something called these advanced glycation end products. Um, we use advanced glycation end products to measure inflammation and the progression of age-associated diseases or degenerative diseases in a person's body. We use it to measure the progression of diabetes. We use it to uh, measure the progression of atherosclerosis, um, chronic kidney disease, Alzheimer's disease. All these things are truly um, influenced by these advanced glycation end products. So advanced glycation end products are important. When I explain this to patients in the room, about advanced glycation end products. And when I try and explain it, I use this, this analogy because this analogy works. I think it works. If you take a bowl and you put egg whites in the bowl, uncooked egg whites, not the yolk, mm, egg whites only. It's slippery and, and it's, it's like elastic and it's like, you know, stringy, I'm not stringy, what's the right word for it? It's slippery, yeah, slippery is the best word, right? What if I put like, 10 egg whites in a bowl and I add a cup of sugar in it and stir it around a little bit, it wouldn't be slippery anymore. It'd be more granular, more crusty, more crunchy, right? That's what's happening in your body. When you have too much sugar in your body, your body was going to end up having these advanced glycation end products that attach to proteins and fats that change their structure and their function. Another issue with this, it's not the just the structure and the function. It kind of is. When you mess with the function of the proteins in your body and fat, you are going to end up causing metabolic dysfunction throughout the body. And what we're going to zero in on today is that metabolic function that's getting jacked up. That's the stuff that causes chronic degeneration in the body that is associated with aging. Okay. So that's that's the key takeaway from that. Um. Another thing, and why I call it detoxification, 
<laughs> because uh, uh, advanced glycation end products are also glycotoxins. And I'm chuckling because it's like, I, the last episode I was talking about detoxification and, and how, you know, what detoxification is real and not real. And sort of like saying, I could detoxify aging is really <laughs> sounds controversial. It isn't though, it isn't. Because glycotoxins is sugar byproducts that are living around in your body that need to get out, but they're not. They're just sitting around and it's interfering and interrupting healthy metabolism, okay? So, so when you have these advanced glycation end products, it promotes oxidative stress, inflammation, it binds to cell surface receptors, causes cross-linking with body proteins. It just basically alters the structure of everything, the way things run throughout your body and the function of your body. So where do advanced glycation end products come from, Brendan? What is this? Where do they come from? And the first thing you think of, you heard me saying earlier, just pour a cup of sugar in a bowl of egg whites. Does eating a cup of sugar cause me to have advanced glycation end products? Absolutely. <laughs> yes, absolutely. But that's not all that causes it. It's not just that. So I, I want you to know, I'm not just because this whole podcast is not me saying you can s slow down aging because you can never stop and you can never cure aging that we know of yet. All right. I'm not saying that you can. You can slow it down, attenuate it, and limit it. But as me just saying, oh, just take sugar out of your diet, going to be the cure. A little bit, but not all of it. This whole podcast, trust me, it's more than just me saying, don't eat sugar. There's a lot more. Okay. The Western diet is rich with advanced glycation end products. You know, um, it's formed when foods are processed at high temperature. It's formed when um, we do deep frying, broiling, roasting, grilling. That's what causes these advanced glycation end products. And um, high temperature processing of certain processed foods like dairy, that's going to cause it. Um, things where we process things like sausage and processed meats, uh, commercial breakfast cereals, all of those are very high in advanced glycation end products. So ultra processed foods are not good. Um, endogenous advanced glycation end products is when you're eating a diet that's too rich in simple carbohydrates. There's too many foods in your diet that convert to sugar too quickly. It doesn't have to be a cup of white sugar, you know, down the hatch. It could be white bread, you know? It could be anything that's high in the glycemic index that you consume. And when you consume that, your blood sugar spikes a little bit. And when your blood sugar spikes, that sugar is not just going to disappear. It sits around your body, creating advanced glycation end products. And um, you would know them a lot of times as one of the ways you measure it is, you know, hemoglobin A1C. You know, you go to your doctor's office and they're always measuring that hemoglobin A1C or they should be measuring it. That's they're testing the, the glycosylated sugar that's, that's the, the sugar that's attached to the hemoglobin. Okay. So um, I opened this up by saying I don't want to be nerdy. And now I'm going to put this image in front of you that is about as nerdy as nerdy gets. And it's so scientific and your head may swim looking at it because mine still does when I look at these images. And I think the people who do these articles and make these images do that on purpose to make it look like they're really smart. But um, I'm going to make sense of this. Okay. I'm going to make sense of this. So the first image, I mean, first of all, let me just say this, all these images, it's going to show you the extracellular and intracellular effects of the advanced glycation end products. I want you to see this. So the first one, it's going to be how advanced glycation end products that form on lipids, collagen, laminin, and elastin. And the formation of advanced glycation end products on the extracellular membrane increases stiffness of the extracellular membrane. The next one is advanced glycation end products. They bind to the receptors for advanced glycation end products. And that stimulates NADPH oxidase. And that increases reactive oxygen species. What does that mean, Brendan? What is all those things you just said? When you have increased levels of advanced glycation end products, it binds to a receptor on your cells. Your cells have a receptor specific for advanced glycation and product products that's looking for it. And when it sees it, that signals down into the cell a change to the way it deals with oxidative compounds or redox reactions in your body. So when you have more advanced glycosylation end products, you're slowing down your ability to deal with oxidative compounds. You're basically causing oxidative damage to your body. You know, that's what you take antioxidants for. So you're, you're basically removing antioxidants from your body. 
when you're taking this. You're slowing down your body's natural antioxidant capacity with these advanced glycosylation end products. And again, you look at this image, you'll see it. These receptors also, when they've been triggered on the cell surface, when they've been triggered by the advanced glycosylation, advanced glycosylation end products, that turns on something called the nuclear factor kappa beta pathway, and that triggers inflammation at a significant rate. The nuclear factor kappa beta pathway in medicine is a big one. It's very important for physicians to do what they can to limit that pathway from being overstimulated. So when you have too much advanced glycation end products in your body, it's going to trigger that inflammatory pathway that gets into your DNA and just upregulates all these inflammatory chemicals to be made in your body. The advanced glycation end products also decreases nitric oxide availability um, and it decreases the activity of nitric oxide synthase. And what that means is you're not able to dilate out arteries like you used to. Things start to constrict. That's what nitric oxide is. Without nitric oxide or nitric oxide synthase, things can be more constricted, not as good blood flow to things. Constricted, that's, that's, you see that up in the brain. The brain doesn't get very good perfusion. Kidneys don't get good perfusion. You know, guys with erectile dysfunction, this is it right there. That's what, I mean, when people take supplements for erectile dysfunction, they're treating nitric oxide synthase with that. That's what arginine, all those things, that's what they're going after. So advanced glycation end products, Reducing the circulating levels of advanced glycation end products with diet and lifestyle is going to promote healthy aging and it's going to create greater longevity in my patients. I know this. I see it. I've been in practice long enough to see this. When I get someone's advanced glycation end product levels down using lab work and lifestyle, things improve. They have better flexibility or mobility. They're more physically active. There's less inflammation in their body. What holds us back? What First of all, think about this. Who's ever talked to you about this? Who talks to you about this? Who, wh why isn't your doctor talking about how to slow down your aging? <laughs> why? This is basic medicine, by the way. This is basic biochemistry, all right? This is something every doctor learned in med school in either their first or second year, depending on how their program structures their, their schedules, right? We learn all about this ad nauseum, all of it. This is the most preventative thing your doctor can do. And the lab work for it is pennies. It's not expensive. And it's easy to do. What holds us back? Why aren't we doing this? Um, the first thing you think is that it's hard to get glucose under control. And that's true. It is sometimes hard to get glucose under control with patients. I can see that. I can see that. Um, but another one, a little bit more valid, is that no one ever explains it to you. No one ever sits down to you and explains to you, you know, by having your advanced glycation end products at this level, it's going to affect your aging this much. It's going to decrease your quality of life. It's going to limit your health span because we have our lifespan and then we have our health span, okay? Your lifespan is how long you're going to live, but that doesn't guarantee the end of it, the last 20 years of it has a health span, meaning you're healthy. You want to have your lifespan and health span be equal to one another. So, so it really is important for the physician to really push out your health span. This is the best way to do it. The best way to do this. So you, we don't get a lot of explanation. They don't sit down and say, what can I eat? What I can't I eat? What, what's the best way to go through this? And, and, you know, a lot of people say, you know, we don't have willpower for this. But I would say, remember back in the 90s when we all collectively as a nation quit smoking. Smoking cessation went down massively. And smoking is addictive compound. It's not easy to quit. But remember, we all quit collectively. I mean, people are joining up now with vaping and stuff. But, that's, but I mean, tobacco nicotine is a very addictive compound. But the whole country collectively quit when they understood the problems that it brought to them. We all quit. So I don't think willpower is really a problem. I think it's a lack of leadership. I think it's a lack of us really understanding it and getting good guidance on it. In order to treat it, it's important that we understand how to measure it. How do we measure advanced glycation end products in our bodies? The first thing we do is hemoglobin A1C. That is super cheap, super easy to test. And it is a precursor to advanced glycation end products. It's a precursor, okay? So it's enough. That's enough to use. Another thing I'll use on top of that is going to be like a C-reactive protein, which is an inflammatory marker as well. Those are my two best metrics for this that I use on the fly, easy, easy tests. How do we lower it then? How can you lower your advanced glycation end products and get some success with it? 
Well, the first thing you need to do is lower the glycemic index of the foods you eat. There's so many books written about this. I mean, some old ones out there is going to be like the South Beach Diet. Any one of those books that talk about the advanced, excuse me, that talk about your, your, your um, um, the glycemic index of foods, the less extra glucose is going to be in the cells binding to and affecting the function of those cells. So lowering your glycemic index is important. Um, increasing the intake of fruits and vegetables. <laughs> it's not bad. I mean, think about this. <laughs> I'm a doctor. I'm saying, here, just eat fruits and vegetables and, you know, like, don't eat sugar. It's so fundamental medicine. It really is though, isn't it? Is it? It's not bad advice. It's not bad advice for a doctor to give you. It's not bad. So, so okay, fruits and vegetables. Um, the decreasing ultra-processed foods from your diet. Decreasing to eliminating the best that you can. Okay? I understand we're not going to all be able to eliminate it. I don't live in that world. I'm not an extremist. I don't believe in that. I meet my patients where they are. Not everyone can change their diet overnight. I know that. There's a lot of emotional overlay. But that doesn't mean I'm not going to get in there with them and do my best. Again, I always think back. We collectively quit smoking. You know? I look at those statistics back then about how people quit smoking. And I think about that. And I think about how people are able to quit that because we all, as a people, turn towards it. I think if we all turn towards this and focus on it, we'd all be able to do a good job. Another way of lowering your advanced glycation end products is going to be improving the method you prepare your foods. You know, there are better ways of preparing it. Deep frying it is delicious. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie to you. I make a mean, I make a mean fried chicken. I do. I looked up, There's you can get Colonel Sanders' original recipes available now. I don't know if you knew that. There's a, a guy in Chicago, I think it was the Chicago Tr Tribune, who was doing an article on Colonel Sanders' legacy, and I think it was his nephew accidentally let the photographer take a photo of the original recipe of leaven, herbs, and spices. So you can access that out there right now. So, you know, fried chicken's delicious, you know? I'm not, I know that. I know that. I don't live in a bubble. But do I eat it every day? No, no. Your body can tolerate a lot, but you got to give it a chance to break from it and recover from it. And if you're eating fried foods every day, there's no solution for that. If you're eating simple carbs every day, there's no solution for that. Or excuse me, there's, the only solution for that is eliminating it and cutting it back down. You can't just allow that to happen without consequence, okay? So changing the way you prepare your foods is also really important really important and also being realistic you know whenever we try and make a hard like say you're going on the road to make a hard right turn in your health not easy to do easier to make incremental changes and hold yourself accountable when i have my patients scheduled for that i, I schedule them for a lab review say you're seeing me for this and you're coming in and your hemoglobin a1c is like you know pre-diabetic at like five eight five nine most doctors would say, you're fine. They don't even care. They'll even say, that's good. That's crazy talk. 5-2 is good, okay? 5-2 is good, and you can do it. How I know that is because I've done it with countless patients. So how do I do it? I sit down with them. I find out what they're eating. I maybe bring my nutritionist in the room. We have nutritionists on staff. My wife is a nutritionist that works with us. We put together what they're eating and we make slight adjustments to what they're eating in a way that they can do it and the way they can tolerate it. And then we run labs a month later. And that that follow-up, we see, well, how are you now? How's everything going? Let's make a couple other adjustments. And we keep making these little adjustments. And what holds them accountable is that lab I'm going to do in a month. And what holds them to it is that I didn't do an extreme makeover on their diet that's so fundamentally radically different that they can't figure it out and get their heads wrapped around it or that i'm not understanding the emotional connection they have to the foods they eat i get it so we, we make a plan that works and that does work so you've got to be realistic with your patients but you also have to have a plan on getting them there step by step by step what else will help this is where i'm going to get nerdy again <laughs> i was so ready with all this stuff and um with my presentation i got so excited about it and then when i met with justin today the producer about what we're doing he was like you know my sister was reading and listening to this am i okay mentioning your sister so actually my sister was listening to he goes i don't know what half the stuff the guy's talking about but it was good i feel like i'm about to do that again to you what's your, your sister's name jamie. 
Jamie, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. But it's important I use these terms a little bit. And I, and I promise you I'll make them make sense. But it's who says the word polyphenol? <laughs> no one. No one uses that term polyphenol. I'm going to. And I have to a little bit. And there's a reason why. So polyphenols have a lot of benefits to our body. They're an important part of our biology, the things that we're supposed to take in. We're supposed to take these in. And they're compounds that are found in fruits and vegetables, polyphenols. And um, they have a lot of beneficial biological activities. It's antioxidants, anti-inflammatory. They're anti-apoptotic, uh, which means they, they, they stop cells from breaking themselves down. Um, inhibition of alpha amylase and, and glucodases, um, glucosidases, excuse me, and anti-glycation activity. That's the thing we want to have is these polyphenols have anti-glycation activity. That means that polyphenols, natural compounds found in fruits and vegetables inhibit sugar attachment to proteins and fats. Why am I making it all about this? Why? I'm trying to get ahead of a shortcut people would want to take. And I see it in my clinic too. Let me just take these pills that are vegetables in a pill. Let me take this vegetable in a powder. Let me take this fruit in a pill, fruit in a powder, fruit in a syrup. That doesn't work. That's not polyphenols. Polyphenols are these chemicals that naturally occur in foods that are in the food, not in the powder. You don't really extract it that way. There's an exception. Um, you can get some good compounds in, uh, there's this weird thing these guys do, and it's where they take berries, like uh, dark skin berries, like blackberries, boysenberries, blueberries, chokeberries, elderberries, and they make a jam with it, right? but they don't make a jam. They puree it and they get an extract a syrup from it that's unsweetened. It's just the pure syrup from those berries. That's legit. That's so legit. But that's not the same as a company selling this powdered vegetable juice. This is the berries that have been extracted, you know, put into a syrup form. It's the whole berry in there. It's not them um, making a powder out of it, which is you lose all the benefit that way. Then there'll be others saying, well, I'll just take the vitamins and minerals that are found on the fruits and vegetables and the antioxidants that are in there and I'll be fine. It's not like that. You need the polyphenols, which are not in the vitamins and minerals. Okay? So polyphenols, got to do it. Got to do. I'm basically pushing you to eat fruits and vegetables. <laughs> and the people will say, okay, there's patients that do this to me in the room and there's probably some of you out there watching this podcast and you need to hear me this, okay? Hear me on this. <laughs> Let me prepare this. I've had patients, I get in the room with them and I say, you got to eat vegetables and all these things. And they leave, they go to the front desk. Like Dr. McCarthy had told me I'd, I'd eat more asparagus, blah, and broccoli, blah. And I don't want to eat this. And, eat this, uh, and they, go, they have a, a temper tantrum about me telling them they have to eat vegetables up front. Okay? And a lot of times these are parents. Okay? And these parents are the same parents that tell their kids they have to eat fruits and vegetables. <laughs> you see this? As adults, are like, I don't want to eat these fruits and vegetables. You make your kids eat it. You got to eat fruits and vegetables. You got to eat fruits and vegetables. You have to. And people say you, they're not going to do it anyway. Okay, fine. But that doesn't mean you're going to get away without consequences. Okay? So just know there are consequences if you're not going to eat fruits and vegetables. Our bodies were made to eat fruits and vegetables. Okay? You need them, please. And you can't get away with just eating, you know, uh, um, a supplement or a powdered drink. That's not going to do it. So what happens to me when I have those patients? Do I yell at them? No. <laughs> I just get frustrated because I know they make their kids eat fruits and vegetables, but they don't do it themselves. I'm like, what are you doing? You got to eat this, you know? Um, with those people, I sit down and find out what will they eat? What will they eat? There's always something you'll eat. My wife's Aunt Robin, um, she told me this one thing and it just sat in my head for all these years. She said, I will just pick the five, give me five fruits and vegetables you'll eat the five you'll eat she had a son um a son, um a cousin and he just wasn't into fruits and vegetables and she said just give me the five you'll do as long as he made that deal with her they made that deal she met him halfway it's i do that with my patients i meet him halfway i try and find what they will eat and i go with that um so back to polyphenols polyphenols have flavonoids like quercetin or catechins in fruit um and then and polyphenolic amides are going to be found in chili peppers Okay, so this is not bad stuff. Um, 
you have uh, vegetables um, that have lignans in there and, and reservatrol. You'll know that that's going to be in berries, uh, egalic acids. Those things are in berries. Elagic acids, excuse me, are in berries. All these things are polyphenols and they're found in fruits and vegetables and they're good and good for you. And these are the things that are going to pull sugar off your cells and slow down the aging process. I'm going long with this one. When it comes to berries, not all berries are made the same. Okay. Um, the most important one's hard to get your hands on, but choke berries and elderberries are going to have the highest amount. They're about 1,000 to 800 milligrams per serving of polyphenols. Um, blueberries are about 535 milligrams per serving. Black currants, about 45. Blackberries, which are one of my favorites, but blackberries, raspberries, strawberries, they're all about 160 milligrams. So you can see that blackberries, raspberries, strawberries, strawberries at 160 milligrams per serving, not as good as if you were to try and get maybe blueberries or if you can find choke berries at the, you probably find choke berries like at Whole Foods or something. I don't know. It's hard to find them. So that's polyphenols. That's me trying to push vegetables on my patients. It's not bad. And I try and give them reasons. I try and give them options. You see what I just did there? Like blueberries are better than raspberries, you know, even though raspberries are delicious and blackberries are totally delicious. But blueberries are going to be better source, better choice for my patients. And, and that's what I go with. And then if they're like, Brenda, I won't eat berries. I go with that syrup, you know, that syrup is what I go with, and then and then that's what I use with them. I try and meet them halfway, at least meet them where I can get them. And if something they're taking isn't helping them at all, I won't immediately discount it. I can't, you cannot invalidate someone like that. Someone comes in and they're taking this supplement, this antioxidant supplement that they believe in, their friend swears by it and they want to do it. I get it. What I do with them then is I say this, let's test it before and after. Don't take the supplement for a month or two. If they're already taking it, have a wash out about a month or something. And then run the lab with them not taking it and then have them take it for a month and run the lab after it and see if it had benefit. I do that with them. I try and meet them halfway. Um, I, I, I'm protective of my patients spending money on something that doesn't work. I'm protective of my patients being taken advantage of by a product that they think they're taking that's going to help them and slow down aging, but there's no way of measuring that it's helping. I measure it. I stand behind them. I say, this will work and this doesn't work. I try and do my best to be supportive of them. Dismissing them when they come in the door and saying, that supplement you're taking is garbage, that's the worst doctoring in the world. But with that said, practicing long enough, there's a lot of stuff out there that just is manipulative and people take it as they think it's going to help them, but it isn't really helping them. And so it's your doctor's job is to try and help you figure out what's working, what isn't working. It's so that way you can make educated decisions. Okay. Again, I said it in the past, I'll say it again. The word doctor comes from the Latin word docere, which means to teach. My role in that room with my patient is to give them a good education on what's happening so that they can make educated decisions on what they want to do. Um, vitamins. Vitamin C. Vitamin C does help. Vitamin C pushes or pulls sugar off of the cell surfaces. So that's helpful for reducing glycosylation. And, you know, vitamin C, you get it in your fruits and vegetables, but you can take that as a supplement too. That's not a bad supplement to take. You know, 1,000 to 2,000 milligrams a day is not unreasonable. And I have run the labs before and after, and that can be effective. Um, it lowers C-reactive protein as an inflammatory marker, and it does help lower hemoglobin A1C along with diet. Vitamin E is also helpful. Alpha tocopherol, that's very beneficial for patients. Um, and vitamin B6. I use pyridoxal 5 phosphate, which is a good version of vitamin B6 at 50 milligrams with those cases. And that's been shown also to reduce advanced glycosylation end products. Alkaloid compounds such as berberis. Berberis is an herb, and and you know, that is effective with diabetes. That is effective with lowering hemoglobin A1C, along with diet. Well, I have a patient, and I don't advise this, but this happens. A person will keep the same diet, and their hemoglobin A1C is a little elevated, and they want to take berberis to see if it works without changing their diet. Berberis works. It'll lower it down. Berberines is a, it's a supplement. Um, I use, I don't know if I could plug a company. I'm going to plug a company. I'm going to plug them anyway. I did, uh, there's this one company I really like for herbs. It's called Gaia. And uh, I've used them for decades now. And that's a good herbal company. I've used them forever. There's other ones out there. I know there's other good ones out there. There's, there's, And I like them. They're good too. I just have used Gaia for a long time. So I know they're found at every health food store. I know Sprouts has it, Whole Foods. But you even see it in like regular chain supermarkets, Gaia. They're out there. It's a good brand. And, and Berberis, you can get that from them as well as a pill version. Because Berberis is a liquid, tastes 
terrible. Don't do it as a liquid unless you're like <laughs> hardcore. I can't. Don't do it. You can try it. Do. Um, what about dietary? What about meat? I'm worried about getting into the whole vegetarian versus not vegetarian. The vegan versus not vegan. I'm worried about that because people have strong opinions on both sides that are valid. And I'm not trying to advocate one side or another. So I'm going to be very specific with this part. If your meat sources are ultra processed, like hot dogs, salami, ham, um, anything that's been ultra processed, that's not going to be good. Okay? Oral intake of advanced glycosylation end products, right? Advanced glycation end products, excuse me. Taking that in orally, like say from um, a hot dog, because there's high levels of that in, in that food, you don't always absorb it orally very well, okay? So it's not like taking it in. So eating a hot dog is not as bad as having like a, a soda, full sugar soda. It's not as bad. Because the full sugar soda, you're going to get the sugar in your body, and then you're going to use that sugar to make the advanced glycation end products. Eating the hot dog, you're going to be getting already pre made advanced glycation end products, meaning sugar's already attached to the protein. This is just taking the sugar with the soda. The hot dog has the protein already pre attached. Taking that in orally doesn't always translate into getting inside your body and having an advanced glycation end product from the hot dog. It's a, it's a low transition. And think of it like this. If you eat cholesterol orally, your stomach acid is going to break it down. Eating, in, eating oral cholesterol, like, like egg yolks, does not necessarily increase your body's cholesterol levels. Okay, So eating advanced glycation end products in your food, which would be like sausage or like salami or like hot dogs, that doesn't always hyper increase your advanced glycation end products. It's not good for you because it's processed and a lot of the nutrition is removed. It's just not good for you. If you're going to eat proteins from an animal source, it's good to eat the actual original form of it. Meaning that's a chicken leg or that's a chicken breast or that's a piece of fish. It's not processed, broken down into like um, another version of it where they've ground it up and added a lot of other weird things to it to make it for you. You don't want that. So when it comes to proteins, I would say stick with that. The ultra processed ones are not as good for us. That's it. I hope this is helpful. And if it is, please like, share, and subscribe. You know, I work hard at these things because I care about them. And these are subjects I get really passionate about. And I've been spending years accumulating you know, <laughs> articles on this stuff and, and thinking about this podcast. So, you know, please give me feedback. Let me know because I love doing this. Thank you so much for tuning in. And uh, I'll see you next time.